Today, I am going to talk to you about a collection of my projects, um, most of them stemming from the mother of them all, <laughs> which is my folded map project. And uh, since I am a multidisciplinary artist, I started off as a photographer, but this is the project that really kind of made me expand outside of my medium of photography to include um, video as well as other mediums. So instead of me explaining to you what folded map is, I am going to show you what folded map is because it had the honor of being covered by a lot of media outlets, um, but this one sums it up in a way that would take me just 45 minutes to do it. They do it in about four. So I'm gonna play this for you so you can know what folded map is. Our series, A More Perfect Union, aims to show that what unites us as Americans is far greater than what divides us. And this morning, we're showing you a new approach to bridging divides in Chicago. Neighborhoods from the city's north and south sides are banding together to take on some very deeply rooted issues. Uh, the differences between these communities, they are stark. But as Adriana Diaz shows us, together they are tackling segregation and the inequity that comes with it. Do you have any of those... Um Posters left? Yeah, I do. Chicago residents Nanette Tucker and Wade Wilson share a love of gardening and craft beer. That would be kind of cool. That would be cool. <laughs> They're like neighbors, sort of. Wade is called your map twin. Why are you guys twins? We're twins because when you follow the map, we touch one another on the map, north and south. Like many cities, Chicago's a grid with many streets spanning north to south. If you fold a map of the city in half, you can match addresses on the north side with the same block on the south side. You lived all your life never thinking you had a twin. <laughs> and now... Now I have one. <laughs> they live about 15 miles apart, but Wilson and his wife Jennifer live in the majority white north side neighborhood of Edgewater, while Tucker is in the mostly black south side neighborhood of Englewood. How would you explain the differences between both of your neighborhoods, which are essentially equidistant from the center, but worlds apart in many ways. It's very clear that neighborhoods primarily on the north side have had more investment. Everything from the street lighting to grocery stores and restaurants, it's plentiful on the north side and it's not here. It's almost like you, you feel a light come on at a certain spot when you're going north. And when you're coming back south, you can feel the gloom that's upon us in Inglewood. Curiosity. They met through Tonika Lewis Johnson, a social justice artist who grew up in Inglewood, a community often in the news. Two mass shootings shot on Chicago. in the head this afternoon. shooting claims the life of a 15-year-old boy in West Englewood. Lewis Johnson created the Folded Map Project, which includes this film, to change the conversation. She contrasts how the same street, like Ashland Avenue, they look very different. Looks on the north side, the sidewalks and the south side the maintenance of the building none of which have anything to do with gun violence only disinvestment Chicago's segregation is due in part to racist policies like redlining where banks would designate properties in minority areas delineated in red as too risky for mortgage lending excluding black Americans from a primary pathway of building wealth home ownership you have neighborhoods that are predominantly black that have low home ownership as a result of the discriminatory practices. Businesses left, so you don't have a business corridor, so therefore you don't have jobs. And now the schools are starting to fail because they aren't properly funded. Her solution, bring the North and the South together with MAP twins. It can feel so overwhelming to try to take on systemic racism, <laughs> but you have found a way to almost chip away at it one person at a time one yeah. pair at a time. Yes. Let's use segregation as the actual thing that can connect us. In her project, she doesn't shy away from uncomfortable truths. How much was your home? It was $61,000. And how much was your home? $535,000. You asked Wade and Annette what they each paid for their house. You know, it felt a little awkward. I think the awkwardness helps people understand how we're all participating in this system that was created before us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't truly reflect how we want to connect with each other today. Frankly, we're privileged. And it's hard to sit next to a friend who hasn't enjoyed that privilege. 
we realize that there's an opportunity to actually do something. Wilson and Tucker are doing something together. Three years after they met through the Folded Map Project, with others they created Englewood Renaissance. which is helping beautify parts of Englewood and is now focusing on increasing home ownership here. Creating a community together. The economics might be different, the neighborhoods might be different, but the core of who I am is pretty much the same as Wade and Jennifer. I want the same things they want. For CBS This Morning, Adriana Diaz, Chicago. This is such an important story. Yes. It's yes, such an important yes. story. You have the same street and the different economic values and why that's happened. And the difference in the numbers, Anthony. Yeah. 61,000 versus 500,000 yeah. plus. But it, it, it's a perfect example to show that story on the same day that we did the 110 project. Yes. Exactly. Because it shows you that it starts there. Yes. And that's why this disparity and pointing out the disparity. Because I know there are many white people who can say, well, I don't have the privilege either. This is it's, not ancient. It's the, it shows ahead. it's not ancient history. No. Yeah. It's, it's, it, no. The, the legacy of these practices from the mid century are with us today, and yeah. they will continue to be with us because the value of these homes is the value of these homes. Yeah. Yeah. And the question now, as we become aware of it, is what are we going to do about it? And recognizing that it is an issue. Yeah. It is a major, well, major problem in as, this country. And as long as that economic disparity continues to exist, you will have these, these differences will persist. Yeah. So much more than planting a garden together. Yeah. That's very lovely, but it's so much more than... Well, excuse her. Uh, <laughs> Planning a garden definitely is important. Planning a garden together, uh, because as he said, the legacy of this history is not only with us because of the devaluation of homes, but also because of the missed opportunities that we all have to connect with each other because of segregation. So she doesn't understand the importance of coming together to do some garden work, which is exactly what... Um, Wade, Nanette, and Jennifer did, okay? They expanded Folded Map themselves. I literally invited them to be a part of the project in early 2017, late 2016, and they have remained friends. That was not a criteria for the project, but they actually thought each other was cool. So they've remained friends, and they decided to expand the project to include block twins. Um, they introduced their neighbors to each other, to do the beautification that you saw. And I'm going to show you just a clip of that lovely little event. It's a concept that's been building for about three years. It started with Tanika Johnson's Folded Map Project. My wife Jennifer and I were the first Northside map twins with our neighbor Nanette here on the 6100 block of South Bishop uh, and we've kept up the relationship for the last three years and we've talked about you know what we can do to build on it in order to close the gaps between the neighborhoods in Chicago with regard to social justice, economic equity and what have you. We started talking about putting a group together and um, somewhat modeling after Tanika's folded map. We decided that we wanted to do like um, block twins. We just want change on our block. We want to matter on our block. We're going to plant flower boxes at the corner entering into the 6100 block on Bishop. Some of the elderly neighbors want flowers in front of their house so we're going to dig up and put flowers in front of their houses and we just coming together as a community from the north side and the community from the south side to bring one community together. We're doing a beautification project just to, to get people from the north side and the south side together, working together to help beautify the block where the residents of this block want it to be beautified. My hope is, is that we'll have broader conversations about how we can support one another, think about why our blocks are similar and different and what are the systemic issues that might drive that difference. 
I'm so excited to see people from all walks of life and different neighborhoods come together to improve the block and make it a beautiful space. To see it happening and to be a part of it happening in a, in a place that I grew up in, in a place that uh, my aunt has lived for years is a beautiful thing. Sadie uh, planted two planters with, she made a new friend. Um, what's her name again? Justice? Yeah. Justice, how old is she? Ten. And how old are you? Nine. Yeah. This is community. Uh, anytime we can get together, meet new people, meet neighbors, make new friends, have a good time in safety, you can't get past it. And I just believe if people give it a chance, Everybody can have it. You just have to give it a chance. So that's one of the ripple effects of Folded Map that I could not have planned or anticipated. And um, I mean, oftentimes share people share with people about Folded Map. The first thing that some people ask is, how did you even come up with this idea? Um, but then there's other people that don't ask that question because they already know, they've already experienced it themselves. So to kind of give you a backdrop so we can just take that question out from the Q&A, um, I made this 30-minute animated film, a folded map at the earlier part of the pandemic when presentations were getting canceled. And since my project is multimedia, it just translated well virtually. So I am going to play for you um, just a short piece of folded map, the film, so you can learn how I created folded map. It all started with my grandmother, Marilyn G. Tenney. She came to Chicago from down south in 1962, on the tail end of the Great Migration. She wanted a better life, to have a professional career. And she achieved it when she came to Chicago and got a job as an administrative assistant at the local Social Security office, what black folks would call a good government job. For seven years, she saved her money while working at the Social Security office to purchase a beautiful two-flat brick building on 62nd and Loomis in Inglewood, the building that I would grow up in with my mom and my two uncles. My childhood was beautiful, unlike anything people would imagine in Inglewood. I played outside every day. I rode my bike with my friends. I met my first friends in life, one of them named Raymond. Him and I would go to the corner store every day for cookies, pickles, and chips. Even my grandmother's best friend, Miss Patterson, lived right next door. She had the same migration story. Every summer, Miss Patterson would make homemade ice cream and sell it to the kids for 25 cents. It was also on this block that I started high school. I started going to Lane Tech High School. And for those that don't know, it's a selective enrollment high school 15 miles north of Inglewood. And it's very diverse with a student body of 4,000 students. But every day, I would have to be at the bus stop by 5.45 a.m. just to make it to school by 8 o'clock. And on that everyday commute, I would look out the window, listen to my Walkman, and notice how my neighborhood was very different from the neighborhood that my high school was in. And this was in 1993, so there was no GPS, no cell phones. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to know the address. You had to know the streets. And so as I was on the train going to school, I would notice that my neighborhood had vacant lots. And the 
neighborhood that Lane Tech was in didn't have any. My neighborhood had hundreds of storefront churches, and there was none in the neighborhood my high school was in. My neighborhood had so many beauty supply stores, and I didn't see any up north. And I would always wonder, why is that? And there's also one detail that I paid extra attention to, the streets. I noticed that the streets were named the same in Inglewood and also 15 miles north in the neighborhood that my high school was in. Streets like Ashland, Polina, Walcott, and Western. And even though those streets were named the same, they looked completely different. But the real fun began once I got to school. I met kids who I felt were reflections of me, but from all over the city, from neighborhoods I had never even heard of. I had a friend named Steve Zhukevich. We had algebra class together. And we talked about hip hop every day. But his name was the first Polish name I had ever said. And then I met my first group of Latino friends from neighborhoods like Humboldt Park and Wicker Park, even back of the yards. And they were the ones that taught me the cultural difference between being Puerto Rican and Mexican. And they told me that I better not ever get it confused. Then I had my friends who were Asian, who taught me the difference between being Chinese and Korean, letting me know that all Chinese people don't speak Chinese. They speak Mandarin too. And then I met a group of friends who I thought were black like me, who lived on Chicago's north side. And then I would come to find out that they were first generation immigrants from countries like Belize, Panama, Jamaica, countries that I had never even heard of. And then there were the friends who were black like me, but from a whole nother side of the city called the West Side. I didn't even know what the West Side was. And they specifically told me it's from Cicero to Laramie and Laramie on down. And then I had my friends who were Filipino. I mistakenly thought they were Latino and they were the ones to tell me, no, we are not. This is what we did every day for four years, getting to know each other's culture, each other's neighborhoods. And at this time, hip hop was thriving in Chicago. So we went to hip hop parties all over Chicago, getting to know each other's neighborhoods. And we quickly learned that the way that you truly get to know a location is through your friendships, through your relationships. And what we also realized was how segregated Chicago is. This map that you're looking at is what Chicago segregation looks like. Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in our country. And it's been that way since before my grandmother came. The blue that you see on this map, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly black. The pink purplish that you see, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly white. And the orange that you see, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino. And the neon green that you see in the center of the map and speckled throughout the top, those are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Asian. And as I thought about my commute and how everything looked so different 
from the south side compared to the north side neighborhood that my high school was in, I came to realize that I was riding through Chicago's segregation. And that's when I started to understand the connection between race, geography, and Chicago's segregation. So if you would like to see the rest of it, you can go to photomapproject.com and get it there. Um, but I also want to share with you uh, just another uh, pair of map twins from the project, them just briefly sharing what it felt like to meet their map twin and to participate in the project. That was like a genuine connection, right? It was like nothing forced or fake. We had a conversation, um, learned each other's differences in community. Um, the things that I talked about or maybe spoke about that I would like to see here in Inglewood, they already had out there. When we spoke, to know that they couldn't even imagine being in the community, not having the things that, I guess, basic necessity. So, yeah, it was interesting. I guess it is, it is really striking, uh, you know, how lucky we are. And we certainly don't think of ourselves as living in a rich neighborhood, but compared to some, we, we are very privileged, you know. So another way in which I expanded the project was to create the Folding Map Action Kit. So many people after the project debuted as an exhibit at Loyola University Museum of Art, um, such a positive response. People start requesting to meet their map twin if I could arrange it, if I was going to be working on the project um, more. And I just knew I wasn't going to be doing map twins for the rest of my life. So I said, let me create an action kit, something to help people participate in a self-guided way. And this is literally for free. You can request it. I'll make sure to send the link that you all can access it. It's this beautiful folder that invites people to run errands in their map twin neighborhood. Because the first thing people do if they have the opportunity to go out the country, what do you want to do? Kick it with the locals. Do what the locals do. So why not apply that same concept to your own city? Um, so some of the errands kind of speak to the ways in which different industries um, disinvest and invest in neighborhoods. Uh, so one of the errands is go buy organic apple. Go buy lotion. You'll be surprised to see how different that experience is. Uh, go take out $20 at an ATM. So to offer people an opportunity to do these errands in another neighborhood that is racially and economically different. If you cannot figure out the um, coordinates of a map and addresses, just go to a neighborhood that's racially and economically different and do these errands. And then people can share back their experience. Um, so that's one of the ways in which the project has expanded. And then, of course, doing presentations with um, organizations and institutions um, created an opportunity for me to engage with more people about Folded Map. And I just want to play for you like a one minute clip of the moment that had me think about the next project that I wanted to work on. By a show of hands, how many of you all are not from Chicago? All right. By a show of hands, how many of you all have been told? to not go to the south side or that it's dangerous. So there lies one aspect of how segregation is and so that was the moment, me start talking to a group of, as you can see, predominantly white freshmen at Northwestern, 18, 19 years old. Um, it just kind of hit me that, wow, you know, this is a very explicit way in which segregation is perpetuated. Um, but what do you do when you are a Chicago transplant, um, non-black, that's told, oh, it's dangerous. You know, you care about your safety, so you will probably, you know, heed that advice. But how long before you discover that maybe that advice is actually rooted in racism. And so I really wanted to explore that. And so I created a project called Don't Go, 
Um, I was able to partner with a friend of mine uh, who is also the Folded Map um, board member because I formalized Folded Map into a nonprofit. Her name is Dr. Maria Creason. She's a sociologist. And because we had so much time during the pandemic, I said, why don't we just interview some people. I could put a call out on Instagram for people to share with us their stories of being told to not go to the South or West Side. Um, anticipating that an overwhelming majority of the respondents would be white people, which for me was an important narrative to add to this conversation, um, because that is how Segregation is perpetuated in program when people are told something that they don't even realize is racist until they get older. So I really wanted to add this complexity to the conversation. So we interviewed about 30 people during the pandemic and uh, partnered with Block Club Chicago to publish five of them. And now it's, you know, in the process of being made into a book. We are working on it. But really, the project is about individuals. Here's an example. Some of you all might recognize Soren, uh, which, you know, we met here. And just to show you the power of, um, you know, creating space for people to gather and meet through whatever shared passion, um, you know, I definitely consider Soren a friend and we met here. And so he was able to share his story about being told to not go to the South Side as all others. And if you're interested in learning more or reading these stories, you can go to my website, tonikaj.com. Um, and I was going to play for you a clip of them kind of answering what that experience was like, um, because they don't just share them being told to not go to the South Side, but what they did to disrupt it and how that made them feel the first time. Um, so with respect to time, I am going to move right ahead to kind of close us out with um, my current project. Um, at the same time that Folded Map was exhibited in 2018, this report came out very quietly. <laughs> and it was called The Plunder of Black Wealth in Chicago. And this report put a dollar amount to the wealth that was stolen and extracted from aspiring black homeowners in the 50s and 60s through discriminatory housing practices. So Folded Map kind of visualized and helped people understand the disparity between the North and the South Side. But this report was very explicit in describing how that disparity began. And so I was shared this report, and of course, I just devoured it, and I wanted to do something with it. But just to give you a background as to what land sale contracts are and how they were used discriminatorily to create this disparity that we see in our city, um, I just want to share this clip with you and then another clip explaining what my project is, and then we can open it up for questions. Is that okay? All right. This is really the origin, in a modern sense, of the racial wealth gap in the United States. And in order to understand that story of how African Americans continue to be at such a position of disadvantage relative to whites all through the 20th century into the 21st century, long after the legal reforms of the civil rights movement, to understand the perpetuation of that gap, we have to return back to this period and understand what were the mechanisms that put blacks at such disadvantages relative to whites. Like many Americans, Sally and Albert Bolton aspired to a home in the suburbs or a better neighborhood inside the city. But in the 1950s, those options weren't open to black families. So they made a down payment on a house in what was called Chicago's Black Belt. For two years, they met their monthly mortgage payments on time. Then one day, they received an eviction notice for being late, one time on one payment. That was when they went to see my father. Mark Satter was an attorney who lived in the racially changing neighborhood, North Lawndale. What they asked of him was just to slow down the eviction. They said, you know, we only missed one payment. Like, we think we could pull this together. And if you could give us some time, you know, we could, we, we could keep it. Reviewing the Bolton's papers, Satter was surprised to see that they had paid three times what the seller had paid for it. In fact, he explained to the Boltons, this isn't a mortgage, it's a rent-to-own installment contract. And the man who drew it up, Jay Garan, 
He's the real owner. After hearing this, they said oh, we were misled in, in, in too many ways, and we need, we, we, we want to sue him, and we want to stop this. As Satter prepared his case, he learned that the Boldens were not alone. And he realizes that throughout the south and west sides of the city, there are brokers who control large numbers of property, and they're all selling on contract, and they're all selling at these huge markups. And he realizes this is horrifically dangerous. This was the way systems worked. It was a scheme by which uh, someone you know, could go into a community and take one house and effectively turn it over and over and over and over again. You wanted to evict people. There was incentive to evict people. Evictions? Contracts? Why? Satter asked himself. What's happening here? Home ownership is the basis of a happy, contented family life. And now, through the use of a National Housing Act insured mortgage, is brought within the reach of all citizens on a monthly payment plan no greater than rent. And that's how it works. Say the price of the home you want to buy is $15,000. You make a down payment of $2,000, and the bank lends you the balance, which you pay off at $110 a month for the next 25 years. Part of your payment goes for interest. That's what the bank charges for loaning you the money. The rest pays down your loan. That's your share of the house. With every monthly payment, your share of the house grows. That's called equity. What if you decide to move? You simply sell the house and keep your share. And if the house increases in value, you keep that too. This is how America's building its middle class and individual families are building wealth, their financial nest eggs. I know, that's how I bought my house, but that's not how black people are treated. Let me show you. It starts with speculators, also called blockbusters. They go into a white neighborhood and knock on doors, telling white homeowners that the blacks are coming. The blacks are coming. Better sell now because the value of your house is going to drop if you don't. I can see your house is worth $15,000, but I'll give you $14,000. Scared, the white homeowner sells. Within days, the speculator hikes the price of the house and sells it to a black family for $27,000. The buyer makes a down payment of $2,000 is obligated to make payments of $252 a month. So why would anyone buy a house at such a high markup? Because white-owned banks refuse yeah. to make loans to blacks, especially if they want to move into a white neighborhood. Desperate for a home and having no other options, they go to the speculator. The speculator draws up a contract. You think it's a mortgage, but it's not. A contract doesn't accrue equity until it's paid off in full. Nada, nothing, no equity. See, it's right there in the small print. Just check the box and sign your name to agree. So what if you want to move after living in the house for, say, 10 or 15 years? You lose everything. Remember, you don't have equity. You don't have a nest egg to borrow against for a child's education, to make home repairs or pay for medical emergencies. And like the Bolton family, miss one payment and you're evicted. There's incentive to evict the buyer so the speculator can keep all the money the family has paid and then resell the house to another buyer. Since the Boltons came to me, I've seen court records of hundreds of evictions on this model. Families on both sides are being built so that the speculators make a fortune buying low from whites and selling high to blacks. Federally insured mortgages to whites, price gouging contracts to blacks. Do you see what this is going to do to Chicago's black families and its neighborhoods? So to kind of demonstrate what this did to uh, black neighborhoods in Chicago, I'm just going to ask you a question, and this is a safe, honest space. Um, why don't you just throw out words you've heard Inglewood described as? I'll let you think about it. The neighborhood of Inglewood on Chicago's south side, by a show of hands, how many of you all have heard of it? Okay. By a show of hands, how many of you all have been told to not go there. Raise my. Okay. Uh, how many of you all have heard it's predominantly black? Okay. How many of you all have heard it's violent? How many of you all have heard that it's poor? Well, that's what this discriminatory period did to neighborhoods like Inglewood. Uh, this is a map of Greater Inglewood. This is all of the, these are all of the homes that were sold to aspiring black homeowners on land sale contracts. And this is just the documented one because they didn't have to document it during that time. 
So the fact that this is, you know, in records is, is pretty fascinating. So the impact of that is, well, they couldn't get mortgages because they were redlined. And so some of them were tricked into thinking that their land sale contract was a mortgage. And so Greater Inglewood today has a home ownership rate of 27, 25%. And it's the direct result of this. These are people who did not own their homes. Some of them thought they did. Some of them went into the contract knowing that was their only option. So my current project is called Inequity for Sale. I was able to befriend the researcher of that Plunder of Black Wealth report and get the addresses. Because I was like, well, if they're calculating how much was taken, then they have to know the addresses. And so they shared the addresses with me, and I started to drive around in my neighborhood and see that a lot of those addresses are present-day vacant lots and are abandoned homes. And I finally was able to answer the question that I had in high school, why is that? And this is why. Um, there are a total of over 3,000 documented land sale contract homes in Chicago, majority of them being on Chicago's west side, which is the epicenter of this. And the only other neighborhood outside of the west side that, was, that has the largest concentration of land sale contract homes is no other than your poster child for everything wrong, the Inglewood neighborhood. And so I am going to just close out by sharing with you what my current project is, and then we can open it up for a couple questions, maybe. Mm -hmm. In the 1950s and 60s, fake mortgages gave the holder all the responsibilities of a homeowner, but only the power of a renter. The predatory process stole more than 3,300 homes and counting from black Chicagoans. 177 of those homes were in Greater Inglewood. Now, this is the focus of activist and artist Tanika Johnson's pop-up installation, Inequity for Sale, the latest in her game-changing and thought-provoking creative projects. I met up with her to find out why she picked this as a moment in history that she wanted to highlight. So being from Greater Inglewood, growing up here and being a lifelong resident of it is really the motivation and inspiration for majority of my work. Um, when you grow up in a neighborhood that has been historically disinvested in and you see how it impacts your personal life, it becomes the point of reference for a lot of my work. I had to travel outside of my neighborhood to obtain access to a lot of the artistic programs I was interested in. I went to high school on the north side because of the lower quality schools that were in the neighborhood as a result of disinvestment. So this issue has pretty much colored not only my life, but everybody who is from this neighborhood. But now you got this new project called Inequity for Sale, partnering mm -hmm. with the National Museum of Public Housing. How did that ball get rolling? This report called The Plunder of Black Wealth came out and it put a dollar amount on the money stolen from aspiring black homeowners whose homes were sold to them on land sale contracts in the 50s and 60s. Greater Inglewood has gained the reputation of being like the poster child of everything wrong in Chicago, but this is the beginning of how that came to be. And so that's when I knew I wanted to do something to breathe new life into this report to help people understand this system systemic issue in a more contemporary way. So these, these land sale contracts, these scams as we call them, they're, mm. it was predatory lending in a sense, right? Yes, so it was a discriminatory housing practice that not only sold homes at an extremely high markup to black families who were redlined into certain communities, but they actually didn't own the homes and they thought they did. And so that's the insidious part of this discriminatory practice is that one, it was just unfair, the actual markup of the homes, but also the lie 
They were lied to. They, they didn't have a mortgage, and they were told that they did. So your project identifies and shows what homes here in Inglewood were impacted by that. So a lot of the homes that are in Inglewood now that are abandoned, a lot of the vacant lot, they were land sale contract properties. And so I view it as, you know, we are living amongst evidence of this crime, this hidden evidence, and we didn't know it. And when we wonder why our homes in this neighborhood have been devalued, have not appreciated in the way that other neighborhoods have, it's because of this history. So this project is identifying a collection of those land sale contract homes and putting land markers in front of them to acknowledge what happened here in this neighborhood and to memorialize the actual homeowners who were really pioneers. This project itself, we're actually at the site of one of the homes, but it's not without controversy. The person who had ownership of this home wasn't very happy about the project. Yes. Took down the marker. Yes. What happened? The most recent owner of this home took the land marker down within two weeks of it being installed. He said that people contacted him and asked if he was the one that stole the property from the people mentioned on the land marker, and uh, he said he was offended by that. So he took the sign off and said that it was a lie. Do you ask permission before you put these up? Um, no, because I specifically selected homes that were visibly neglected and abandoned, and personally, they are the perpetuation of the exact issue that my project aims to illuminate. Also being a homeowner in this neighborhood and a resident, I literally have no respect for people who have property in my neighborhood that has been historically disinvested in and they don't care for it, they don't keep it up, and it becomes an eyesore that decreases the value of the other homes that are on the block. So even though the landmarker didn't seek to call out the current owners. The reason that I selected these homes is because they are the consequence of this discriminatory practice in the 50s and 60s. So you are an artist who has taken an active part in using your art to create change and to get people to really mm. actively engage. Art is my personal love language. <laughs> it's how I connect with people, the way in which I've built amazing relationships across race, nationality, because we share passion in art. And I think that art is the perfect platform to help people engage in really hard, difficult issues personally and uh, delicately, if you will, uh, because you, you can't always do it through legislation or politics. And art really allows people to engage with these issues in a more personal, introspective way. My hope is that when people come visit the landmarkers, that they talk to people who live on this block or that the people who live on this block will definitely ask them, oh, what are you, know, what are you doing over here? And that's the important thing that art can do. It can bring people together. Um, I was curious, have you heard from the families or the descendants of any of the people like who were you were saying, you know, had tried to have buy the house? Like, have you heard from any of those yeah. families like about that legacy on their family side? Yes. So um, in a very, what's the word? Serendipitous? Is that the word? Okay. All right. Um, in that particular way, I have. Um, so I had recently installed, because I'm doing a collection of 15, and I just installed the six more. And within one week, another one was <laughs> taken away. And so I went to that block and I asked, you know, the people I had engaged with, like, did you all see who did this? And they were like, we thought it was you because, you know, we thought you just were going to have it up for a little while. Anyway, so they introduced me to the actual relative of the people who were mentioned on that landmarker because the people who was sold that home on a land sale contract, they eventually did become owners. They were able to actually pay the, you know, monthly fee until they became owners and they were able to 
get another house across the street, and that's where their children um, live today. And they're older. They're like in their late 60s. And so because of that incident, I was introduced to one of the descendants who was able to talk to me about um, his parents and him not even knowing what they went through to get the house that he was raised in. And so it was new information for him. Um, but it was because of that moment I, I got connected to a descendant. Um, and then I recently had an event at another one of the landmarkers. And one of the people who came to the event told me, oh, I actually, I know this family that was mentioned on the landmarkers. So, um, so far... I have been able to get connected to two descendants, so I'm trying to, you know, see what way that they would like to to be involved. Thank you for the question. So I'm just curious, like on the, obviously there was, you know, a lot, over 3,000, right? Do you know what, on average, are most of the homes that were purchased through this method mm -hmm. did they end up in poor condition like was were there any that were able to like break the cycle so to speak or is this pretty much like 90 percent of them um away? a lot of the according to the report um you know there was a you know considering everything that they were up against it was a high percentage that were able to actually keep their homes and get their homes. Um, but unfortunately, even though there were many individuals that were able to acquire ownership of the homes, uh, so many people lost their homes that the neighborhood was ultimately impacted. So it still wasn't such a great achievement because the people who did actually pay their you know, monthly fee and, and became owners of their home, their home was still devalued as a result of all of, you know, the decay that eventually happened around it. So, um, you know, it's it's kind of like a, a bittersweet thing. Uh, the relative of one of the people mentioned on the landmarkers that I was connected to, you know, they're basically considered a, a success story because they were able to own their home but now the home that they own is not worth what it could have been um, because so many people um, lost their homes and a lot of them are abandoned and vacant. Um, now the west side of Chicago, like I said, was the epicenter of it. So even though a lot of people own the homes um, now, um, you know, they still, the West Side, those particular neighborhoods and Greater Inglewood are the only neighborhoods in Chicago that have a huge vacant lot stock. And it is only those neighborhoods that were impacted by land sale contracts that have an abundance of vacant lots and abandoned homes. So um, the report kind of gets into that a little bit, but but yes, to answer your question, there are there were some families that did um, get their home and was able to, if you, th if you want to call that generational wealth, <laughs> I still think they were stolen from because the opportunity to have the equity that they did not have for however long it took them to pay it off, they still, they still didn't get. It. But no, I love that question. Thank you. First off, I want to say thank you. As a Chicago native, I'd like to see you represent. Oh, uh, thank you. My question was, first, also, I want to say that this is a great project, and I love the name for it because I think it's really indicative of how this could be used as a metric. Mm. Is What is the primary axis of the fold? Like, you know, you take the map, are you folding a hamburger? Are you holding you? Because I think you could also use it and fold a hot dog, too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, are you talking about what part is the, the fold? Yeah, uh, it, north, south. For this, yeah, it's, it's, it's downtown, zero, Madison. That's, that's the zero mark. But, you know, I remind people, it is an art project. 
It can be origami. You can fold it any way. You can go northwest to southeast. You know, you can do it a lot of different ways. But, you know, if you're really a stickler on our city being on a grid system, you can mathematically, you know, fold it a few different ways. Because even though some of the streets aren't named the same, they do have a numeric value because we are on a grid system. So you could basically find, you know, a, a variety of coordinates. But um, I did just do it on the traditional fold, the zero Madison. So um, one of the reasons that I focused on my home neighborhood of Inglewood is because that's where I'm from, but also um, because the, you know, neighborhood that is literally its mathematical twin um, is Rogers Park, Andersonville, and Edgewater, and it is 6400 North. So to kind of help people understand um, the uniqueness of our grid system and how it literally makes it easy to kind of visualize this segregation and disparity and the irony of it, um, that's why I wanted to help orient people on what our our reticular grid system is. (laughs) But ultimately, racially, economically different neighborhoods, you don't have to know about all, like, addresses. Just look at a map of the racial demographic, and you can figure out a fold yourself. So thank you for that. Thank you for your work. You did a wonderful job. I really liked how you uh, told your story, you know, with the pictures and helping to uh, show what you're trying to do and... uh, Showing the pictures of your, I mean, the stories of your your elders or maybe your ancestors. I grew up in Inglewood, too, starting from the early 70s. So there's a lot I could relate to and maybe have a conversation with you later. But I just really appreciated how you uh, really respected history mm-hmm. and used history in those stories to, to make your points. That was very effective. Thank you. And, you know, it's my belief that um, all of our individual and personal histories kind of make up um, where we are today. And unfortunately, um, segregation keeps us from meeting people that we could potentially have strong relationships with. And we are all paying the cost for... Um, you know, kind of upholding this this system and not necessarily trying to find personal ways to disrupt it. It doesn't have to always be through protests or legislation. Just I wanted my work to help people know that it can come in the form of small personal decisions, like just deciding to go to a different grocery store um, deciding to go to an event in a neighborhood you were told to not go to or go to someone's house that's from a neighborhood you're unfamiliar with. Um, I can't tell you how many times growing up that um, friends couldn't come to my house, my house on my beautiful little block (laughs) um, because of the stereotype. So, you know, I just just hope that my work helps people understand... um, the power of relationships and how we have been denied an opportunity to meet each other. And high school for me was the space in which I was able to like see the beauty of and benefit of diversity. Um, You know, you learn more about other cultures, but what you also learn is how to affirm what your own identity and culture is in, in meeting new people. And, and so that's the hope of my work and using history to kind of show how we have been intentionally kept apart. Thank you. In the, uh, the action map for the Fold-Ind uh, map project at the end, mm-hmm. uh, I could see from far away, there was a uh, big block letters, remember you are not a tourist. So I was just wondering <laughs> if you could like expand on that, right? Like how do people from historically, um, privileged neighborhoods go to historically marginalized neighborhoods in a way that it's respectful and doesn't become poverty tourism? Yes. So tourist meaning, um, thank you for asking that. Tourist meaning, you know, when you're a tourist, you're literally not from a place. And so, you know, because Chicago is so segregated, you know, 
I wanted people to understand that all of this city is all of ours. And so you're not a tourist. You're literally a Chicagoan just going to another neighborhood, you know? And, and also, um, that's why I created the Action Kit, so that people can have a very normal way to kind of understand inequity while also just being a reg or participating as a regular resident. You know, because tourists, you're going to a specific destination to do a specific thing. Um, the action kit was a pathway for people to, as close as possible, feel what it's like to be a resident. And if you can use that experience as a reference to compare to your own neighborhood, then hopefully you'll be able to kind of see what it is to walk through somebody else's shoes um, and to know that oh, no, this, this is an inequity. And then also for people from disinvested neighborhoods, because segregation has like screwed all of us up in some weird way that even a project like mine, <laughs> some people interpret, oh, you just want white people to come to black neighborhoods. And I'm like, no, you just think that because that's all you're thinking about. Um, yes, there are black people on the South and West sides who have not gone to certain North side neighborhoods for a variety of reasons, and my project is also encouraging them to go to neighborhoods um, that are historically invested in so that they can see what convenience is like. We don't have to reimagine it. It's literally existing in our city, and to know what they can advocate for, you know, because sometimes um, when you're from a disinvested community and you might not have the opportunity to explore other neighborhoods, you don't know what your neighborhood should have or what it could have. And so it's really important to experience other neighborhoods all the way around. Um, so that's what I was trying to get at. Like, you can act like, approach the project as, you know, being a tourist in your own city, but really you're just going to see what it's like to, um, what your neighbor goes through. And that's, that's how I hope people kind of approach it. Like, you know, I do have distant neighbors. It's not just people who live in my neighborhood. Because we have so many streets in Chicago that do run the full city length. So, you know, you do have some distant neighbors. So that's, that's kind of what I meant. <laughs> oh, it's all my virtual people. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I do want to add this. Um, you know, if you're intrigued or just extra nosy, you can definitely go to um, my website, tonikaj.com. Um, I have all of the links to my projects there. And I live on Instagram. Um, you know I do. <laughs> so I update. Uh, I share a lot of updates about my projects on Instagram. My handle is Tonika J. And I love to remind people that even though, you know, social media, people have a lot to say about what it is and how horrible it is, it's still a tool. And just like how algorithms get created, you have to constantly disrupt them if you want to see something different. I love social media as practice for what you have to do in your own life. Like, I definitely always click on new people's things to like, so it can change what my algorithm is. So um, definitely follow me there. I'll follow back. I'll like some stuff that you share. And, you know, we can have our little folded map relationship on Instagram. <laughs> mm -hmm.